our days, the village of Korgaljin is located 120 kilometers to the west from the capital of Kazakhstan. It seems like an ordinary village with no sights and attractions at first glance, but not for explorers of the past. We joined the team of the Research Institute of Archaeology named after Kamal Akishev, which operates at the Lev Gumilyov Eurasian National University to look for traces of past life. Now we're going to another side of Lake Shalkar. There's a wintering ground not far from the lake. Recently, the public has become accustomed to sensations and discoveries dated more than 2,000 years old. In the glory of these discoveries, the past works of archaeologists and other eras has somewhat faded. The 19th century had also something to offer to archaeology. Living in the large city, seeing the step from the window of a skyscraper, a descendant of a nomad should know how his great-grandfather lived in the same place, in the same climate. Due to this, we joined the Master of Archaeology and Ethnology, Azamat Dukombayev, who has studied the Kazakh wintering grounds for 10 years. He travelled all over the country, saw the rocky wintering grounds of the Mangistau region, wintering grounds from limestone in the east and wooden wintering grounds of the north. The wintering grounds of his small homeland are the main purpose of his study. There's only earth, water and clay from which in ancient times God created man. Their standard wintering typology based on the science of archaeology, the study is made by Joldasbaev. He identified four monument groups that relate to the wintering grounds. The first group is Kistau, which means a single wintering ground. The second is Kistak, which means a group of wintering grounds or a settlement. Third is the temporary shelter, while the fourth is called Kenkala settlement. In this case, we'll visit wintering Kistau, and this wintering ground is amazing because it includes up to 20 detached estates. The old bed of the river located near the settlement is surrounded by stripped green lawns. Winter in these areas is snowy, wind comes from all directions, and the steppe inhabitants thoughtfully approach the choice of the place, taking into account the nature and climate. You cannot immediately see it, but the wintering area is a lowland. The nomads prefer to find the areas with their abundant pastures, hayfields and reeds for fuel. The main characters of these wintering grounds is that two rooms were often combined under one roof with a flat shed roof. The first room was to keep cattle in especially cold seasons or cattle that were born in winter. People lived in another room. There was one entrance for both rooms in order to keep warmth. Here you can see the entrance very clearly. There's a small hole in the wall. Entering here, we find ourselves in the corridor where people lived. Probably people can enter another room from here and most likely this is already a residential block. There are quite a lot of rooms because there was a big family. These rooms are interconnected. You need to have a good imagination to picture such a house. A good owner built quickly. He netted clay, assembled the walls, made a ceiling, put the reeds on top which he collected on the nearest lake, smeared it with clay and sprinkled it with ash to keep warm. They kept the house warm in different ways. Sometimes they built stoves with a chimney. The house was warm due to the livestock because animals lived with people under the same roof during the coldest winters.
Для обычного человека прогулка. A walk in the step is an occasion to collect such a beautiful bouquet for some people. But a specialist will find a real archaeological discovery under his feet. Take a closer look. These shafts, imperceptible at first glance, are an old wintering place. But in addition to earth embankments, you can also find material evidence that people lived here, for example a pitchfork. What distinguishes them from modern ones is that they have only three tines. The stereotype of an exclusively nomadic lifestyle of the steppe people is ruined with the discovery of settlements from the Iron Age as well as the presence of settlements from the Middle Ages and modern times. The first great researcher of Kistau was Ali Khan Bokeikhan, who even before the revolution studied the life of the Kazakh people and transferred this knowledge into the economic sector. Our archaeologists have scientific thoughts and ideas. Through this exploration, inspection, topography and description, we will learn how the Kazakhs lived up to the 20th century, when this type of economic management after collectivization was lost in the past. Fragments of dishes are very helpful in research as it's used to determine the date of the settlement. Fragments with a stem of 19th century porcelain factories and bottoms with Soviet gauze were also found here. While examining the graveyard, Azamat assumes that the wintering traditions ended its existence in the 1940s to 1950s of the 20th centuries. Two of the four stones were installed as monuments without burial. Kamila Saparova is a junior researcher at the Research Institute of Archaeology named after Kamal Akishev. Her task is to make a wintering scheme with no less than 20 estates. Measurement is the simplest so far. One step is one meter. Then the scholar chooses one object and draws up its plan. We're now at the farmyard. You can see that an entrance is located on the southeast side. It leads to the main corridor-like room, from which the entrance to other rooms leads. I assume that there are three rooms on the left side. These are probably living rooms. There's a farmyard opposite. It's quite impressive in size. There's more space depending on the number of rooms. Although it may have been an outbuilding because the rooms there are quite the same size, but here they are all different. Kamila Saparova has been studying wintering grounds in the Tengiz Korgaljin area for two years. She had to choose a new topic. After all, she defended both her diploma and dissertation thesis on the Bronze Age. It's important to understand that these field studies are of great importance for science. Kistau is the most important due to the harsh climatic conditions and it tells about the lifestyle and activities of the Kazakh ethnos in the 19th century. We've climbed to a height of about 100 meters. Because the wintering is very large, about a kilometer long. Now we will study this wintering place by taking photos every few meters, and then we will study these photographs. The frame overlap will be about 80%. Thanks to such a large crowding of images in one place, we will subsequently be able to get a high-quality topographic plan of this object. Many, many photographs stacked on top of each other will give a very high resolution. And when we zoom them on a computer, we'll be able to see the smallest details up to several tens of centimeters in size. This is an important part of the analysis and study. The team of the expedition of the Akishev Research Institute of Archaeology includes its director, Maral Khabdulina, who is a famous Kazakhstani archaeologist, associate professor of the Department of Archaeology and Ethnology of the Lev Gumili of Eurasian University. Maral Kalimjan Kiza is a mentor, master, a great connoisseur of the history of the entire Akmola region. The archaeologists spend the whole day at the site. We found some major things during a visual inspection. These are fragments of a cast iron cauldron, fragments of porcelain dishes and dishes from the Mayday factory.
фарфоровую посуду в первомайской фабрике. Тут даже штамп есть. There's even a stamp from this factory. We also found fragments of porcelain dishes from the Kuznetsov Brothers factory with stamps, copper products, fragments of porcelain bowls of cups, plates and a sharpening stone. This is the Nura River. Everything you can see here is the Nura River. It flows from there and flows beyond the village of Korgaljin into the system of Korgaljin Lakes, which are called Tingis Korgaljin Nature Reserve. The Korgaljin State Natural Reserve is now included in the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization's World Heritage List. The famous flamingos nest here as they did a thousand years ago. Generations of Kazakhs lived here for a thousand years. In my opinion, this area is the site of the formation of the Kazakh ethnos and a number of toponyms, acronyms, hydronyms that are recorded here. All of them are associated with the history of the 15th to 16th centuries. All our historical signs, especially of course archaeology, it practically did not turn to the history of the Golden Horde, to the history of the Ulus of Jochi, although a huge part of our national history is related to this particular period. In contrast to the extensive studies of medieval urban culture in the south of Kazakhstan, these steps haven't been thoroughly studied. Usually they are remembered when people talk about the Bronze Age, after which a huge number of settlements and mausoleums remained. And the Kazakhs, unlike the ancient tribes, did not leave traces. They used their favorite clay brick material, which literally dissolved in the environment for decades. The first who seriously studied the Kazakh period was Alki Margulan 70 years ago. The Akishev Research Institute of Archaeology is studying the Tengiz Korgaljin steppes because in addition to wintering, there's an accumulation of mud brick mausoleums. All of them are valuable objects of historical and cultural heritage. Ten years ago, we took part in the exploration for the first time in this region. Many mausoleums had a slightly different look. Now we're seeing that they are destroyed over time. There are serious concerns that the next generation will not observe these monuments. Therefore, archaeologists initiated a project titled Digital Reconstruction of Cult Memorials of the Sacred Landscape of the Tengiz Korgaljin Surface Depressions. All summer, the researchers travel across the steps from one bureau ground to another bureau ground. They had the necessary equipment and took thousands of pictures to create a virtual copy of the area in a 3D model. At first sight, these buildings are similar to each other, but if you take a closer look, each of them is special with its own story. We're now 10 kilometers from the village of Korgaljin. The clay brick mausoleum with a diameter of 7 meters rises 6 meters above the step. Local residents said that this mausoleum was erected over the grave of Kaji Alim Tomar. He was a wealthy man and as a devout Muslim went on the Hajj. But unfortunately, on the fifth day of the journey, he died, not far from this place. And over his grave, a mausoleum was erected here at the place of his death. The events are dated by archaeologists to the middle of the 19th century. During this time, the sacralization of the mausoleums took place, which is proved by several later burials nearby. In the era of modern times, this land was important for many Kazakh families. A large number of people lived here, and monumental clay mausoleums were erected over the graves of wealthy or religious people. This tradition continued until the middle of the 20th century. Why does this mausoleum remain and the winter grounds are completely destroyed? Was it that people built the safe mausoleums but not the shelters? Ordinary people used to live in the winter grounds, and such mausoleums were erected over the graves of noble, important and influential people. High-quality bricks were probably made here. We see that the bricks are preserved perfectly. They are laid in several rows vertically and horizontally. Clay for bricks was taken here. Obviously, the mausoleums were built by professional builders. This is not a sun-dried fence, but a real architectural structure although it was made using short-lived materials. 
Having seen the mausoleum, the team gets down to business. Several years will pass, and this clay structure on the clay foundation will finally collapse. To maintain its accurate digital appearance, you need to follow the scheme. This is a drone flyby from above, photographing from one angle. Then we photograph this mausoleum with a drone in a secular manner from a lower height to fix its upper part. Then we make a ground survey also in a secular manner. In the same way, we make an offset of 10 degrees. The same procedures are repeated. Then hundreds of images after processing will turn into a 3D model. While Daniar was working, we walked around the mausoleum with a member of the expedition, architect and urbanist Tamirtas Iskakov. We have sand, which was used for construction, mixed with clay, earth, salt, straw. The thickness of the walls here is almost one and a half meters. It is about four bricks. We believe that due to the thickness of the walls, it was possible to build these mausoleums, the height of which is more than six meters, and in spite of such a long period of time, it still remains strong. This is an environmentally friendly material made from all natural ingredients available to local residents, and a clay brick characterizes our steppe architecture. One of its properties is just the same, which many consider a disadvantage, but I, for example, believe that this is a kind of advantage, precisely fragility. Because these mausoleums were built by the steppe dwellers and there's also a semantic meaning here, that we are guests in this world, and even after death, these mausoleums that we built, they last 100 to 200 years maximum, and in a natural way they turn into earth again. As an architect, the Mirtas calls for the use of sun-dried brick in modern construction as an example of ecological housing. Its development impressed the builders worldwide. A three-meter arch, internal niches, patent masonry. According to the stories of local ethnographers, the construction of the mausoleums in the 19th century costed at least 20 horses. Now we can see another example of clay brick architecture at the existing cemetery in the village of Jumai. Ak Edil Kojas's Mazar, a mausoleum, stands out against all the rest. It seems to be like a building from another era. The mausoleum is the embodiment of the traditions and beliefs of the people from the 19th century. It resembles a yurt, a traditional nomadic dwelling in shape, and due to a hip dome with a round opening on top, a tandoor, a cylindrical clay or metal oven used in cooking or baking. Ak Edil Koja is known as an Islamic missionary and educator. He collected taxes from wealthy people and he opened religious schools in the villages for children of all ages and social groups. He helped those in need and paid travel expenses for people who wanted to make the Hajj. We see here a hexagonal vault which closes at the turret and we can only assume that it was a finished cone-shaped tower or it was still an open cylinder through which the sun got inside. And this also created some kind of special atmosphere, a special meaning for those people who visited the saints' graveyard. The builders and architects who built this mausoleum, they already thought not just about how to decorate it beautifully, but they also wanted to create that atmosphere of an open space. This is what we call architecture. There are alcoves in the form of semicircular arches with round rosettes on the edges of the outer walls. There are windows in the form of triangular arches in the center of the alcoves. It resembles the step geometry. The mausoleum, in addition to the expressive form, has a complex semantic meaning. The shape of the entrance resembles a human figure and refers to the stone tombstones and ball balls of the pre-Islamic period. The archaic details of the design of the outer side of the mausoleums have been known in the step cult form since the early Iron Age. People used to believe that these traditions were primordially Muslim. Therefore, sometimes without even thinking about it, we take our truly nomadic relics of beliefs for primordially Muslim. Говоря 
уже об ортодоксальном исламе, да, на Аравийском полуострове. Мы там... It relates to the construction of such mausoleums. You can't see them anywhere except our step, not to mention the orthodox Islam in the Arabian Peninsula. We will not find any grave structures there at all. And these mausoleums, they take their origin at least from the Bronze Age, the very rocky mausoleums of Baghazi with the stone fences. After all, they are also approximately six to eight-sided in shape. They contain a square stone box around and in the center. All this has an uninterrupted connection, a continuous genesis throughout the steppe territory and throughout the history of the steppe people. The main function of these buildings is to worship the souls of ancestors. Often archaeologists do not find burials in mausoleums. These are a kind of memorial complex. Both in Kazakh legends and in Kazakh literature, we know that if there is a need to spend the night in the steppe, then you need to try to find a mausoleum and spend the night there. Because by being there, you will be under the protection of the ancestors. The only thing you need to do is to read a prayer for the peace of their soul and they will protect you from evil spirits. It was considered dangerous to spend the night in the open steppe, since many villains and evils can be seen in the steppe. And being protected by ancestors was considered safe. The painstaking work on the creation of a 3D model is ongoing. Take a few steps back so we change the shooting location, and not just the exposure. And again, we take the necessary series of shots. Clay brick mausoleums are symbols of the spiritualized sacred area. Scientists believe that their concentration in the Korgaljin region is evidenced by the existence of a special spiritual center here since the early Middle Ages. When Russian travelers saw the variety of mausoleums in the 17th century, they thought it were the remains of a large city. This mausoleum is called Balabit, an old cup place for Kazakh people. The mausoleum is a two-chambered building. The clay brick architecture is a unique structure here. Why? Because it resembles the Golden Horde architecture, which has been preserved throughout the steppe territory precisely since the era of the Ulus of Jochi. Since that time, Islam became the state religion of this large Muslim state and other countries wanted to have friendly relations with the state in the 14th century. It was the most powerful Muslim state on the territory of steppe Eurasia. An old cemetery near the Abai village, Balabayit Mausoleum. Judging by the stone installed at the mausoleum, it belongs to a man named Gabiden from the Tamesh clan, who was buried here in 1936. These are two chamber mausoleums. Each chamber has its own name. The first part of the chamber is called Burkhana. This is the place where they were supposed to sit and pray. And the second part is called Ziratkhana, the place where the burial itself was performed. The architecture of the building itself is important for us. This lancet entrance is decorated here. We can calculate the thickness of the walls. It can be seen very well that the thickness of the walls was four or three bricks. These clay giants were built without a foundation. At first sight, it seems that there's a mausoleum on a hill. During the erection, the soil for clay bricks was collected around the object, and over time the walls floated down, forming this hill. The analysis of the materials collected during the expedition in the Korgoljan district showed that it was a large center of masses of the building art, which presupposes a high level of economic development. The age of architecture traditions is seven centuries. Due to natural and anthropogenic factors, 
Most of the medieval monuments have not survived to these days. However, there's an opportunity to draw cultural analogies through the study of Kazakh mausoleums of modern times, and digital technologies help to preserve them. Thanks to the work of specialists from the Akishev Research Institute of Archaeology, now 3D models of mausoleums are in the scientific base and are available for study. And now, following the path of the Yesil archaeological expedition, we will move to the area between the Nura and Yesil rivers. This is a special sacred territory, the center of Eurasia, which has become a crossroads of nomadic cultures. Monuments of all eras have been discovered here. Together with Professor Jean-Luca Bonora from Italy, specialists from the Akisha Research Institute of Archaeology have explored the banks of the Sileti River and discovered several groups of objects. Maral Khabdulina calls the Sileti River the Great One for its significance for the steppe civilization. At the foot of the Kishi Mailan Hill, her team excavates a mound one of twelve at this site. Here you can see the road Nur Sultan Pavlodar and cars driving down the road. Excavations are in full swing now. Geologists suggest that this is a tomb of the Turkic time. A person is laid with his head to the east, which is typical of this period. For comparison, the Mongols buried the dead with their heads to the north and in the Bronze and Iron Ages facing the sunset. The mound is 11 meters in diameter with a stone shell of 30 to 40 centimeters thick. There were slabs at the head. Over the years, due to precipitation, they collapsed and damaged the remains. Due to the same moisture, the bones are poorly preserved. It was difficult for us to excavate because of this stone mound. There were many stones over the skeleton, bones, cervical vertebra, arms, everything broken under the weight of the stones. Undergraduates and PhD students of the Archaeology and Ethnology Department of the Lev Gomilyov Eurasian University are taking part in the excavations. Third-year student Damir has already worked in the excavations. We're Kazakh people and we're a superstitious nation. We believe in signs. Some say never wake up with sleeping ancestors and I'm afraid of that. But I think it's okay since we do it for our studies. It's undoubtedly one tribe, maybe even one clan. And all burials refer to approximately the same time, to the life of one or two generations who lived in this area in the Middle Ages. These mounds are a kind of marker of the ethnic territory. They were installed on the hills and people who lived here, they put these mounds on the tops so that other people, other nomads and tribes know that the ancestors of one tribe are buried here and this land belongs to them. Maral Kalimjan Kize suggests that the mound dates back from the 7th to the 13th centuries. Islam has already spread in the 13th to 14th centuries. Consequently, the Muslim rite did not imply such powerful burials and mounds. Muslims were buried according to Sharia, a small mound, a grave mound. The day goes by, and here is the grave in front of us in the same form in which it was at the time of the burial of a person about whom we, his possible descendants, do not know anything. Archaeologists will study and analyze these remains. Now we're anticipating the most interesting part of our studies. We will take samples for DNA, that is, we will take teeth. In addition to DNA, we will send these teeth for radiocarbon analysis. And to exclude the ingress of fresh organic matter, you need to work with metal tools. Be sure to wear rubber gloves and pack everything in sterile zip bags with no access to oxygen. The sample of teeth will have a long journey to one of the European laboratories where scientists will find out the date of the burial, the age of the owner of the teeth, what ethnic group he belonged to and even what he ate. In general, archaeologists consider the find successful. In northern Kazakhstan, this is the third investigated Turkic burial.
Rain covers the step. Autumn is coming and the excavations will be finished. The scientists will be engaged in their research at their office. This cycle in the life of archaeologists is as indestructible as life.